Welcome to Sky Sports IndyCar and I'm delighted to say joining us this week is Alexander Rossi. Now Alexander, last time I saw you, 2016 in the UK, you were packing your bags to go and test at Phoenix. You'd never driven an IndyCar, you'd never been on an oval and there was a fair bit of trepidation about it. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a blast from the past for sure. So, um, you know, for those that don't know, you know, I, I spent you know, a large part of my career in Europe and, and chasing the, the F1 dream and semi achieved that in, in 2015 with, with Manor. Um, and so for me, 2016 was going to be my first full season in F1 with, with Manor. And, you know, I was in England in, in the January, February months of 2016, kind of training for that and, and ready to go testing, um, in Spain. And, uh, a, a very quick turn of events um, changed that. And no, not only was I no longer driving in Formula One, I didn't have a, a ride to drive anything in 2016. And I was very, very blessed and, and fortunate. At that time, Michael Andretti was adding a fourth IndyCar to his program. And in the past, he had always been three cars. Andretti Autosport was a three-car team. And so he merged with Brian Herta Autosport and kind of brought the fourth car into the fold. I had talked to, to Michael back in 2015 and, and there was some mutual interest, but he didn't have space at the time. So he kind of found out what had happened with me and on the F1, the European side of things. He had the extra car. Um, so from the time he reached out to me, packing my life up and, and heading back to the States was kind of a two week period. And um, yeah, you're right, went, went straight to Phoenix um, and never seen, a car in a novel before had never, I knew nothing about it. You know, my, my entire focus, my, my whole junior career was Formula One and, and that was it. So it was, it was to a lot of people surprise, a bigger culture shock for me to go back to the States than it was for me to initially go to Europe when I was, when I was 16 years old. So yes, that is, that's the last time we saw each other. And uh, here we are, fast forward six years later and um you know i'm, I'm so thrilled and, and thankful to have found a new home in in the ntt indycar series yeah and you've gone from strength to strength just talk us through those, those opening first few laps because for drivers making the transition across from formula one to indycar the road and street courses you somewhat feel at home on but the ovals it, it's very different it is very different and i think that you know from from the outsider's perspective whether you're involved in, in racing or not it looks, it's a circle, right? You know, you, you look at that compared to a road and street course where you have obviously a varying degree of, of corners, corner speeds, braking zones, acceleration, you know, sequences of corners that are stacked on top of each other versus just going in a circle, you would think theoretically that's, that's much easier. And it's, it's not because it's a completely, it's almost a completely different sport. You know, on an oval, you have to be able to, to understand and kind of predict what the car is going to do before it happens. Because, you know, if you have a big oversteer moment on a noble, you crash, right? If you have a big oversteer moment on a road street course, you know, you might miss the apex, you might drop a wheel in the dirt, you know, you'll lose some lap time, but you're in theory, probably not going to crash. So on an oval, you've got to be able to predict what the car is doing before it happens. Um, and then on top of that, because your average speed over a lap is anywhere from 190 to 230 miles an hour versus a road course where it's anywhere from 90 to 110 miles an hour your, your margins are are that much smaller they're infinitely smaller so so there's really no room for error from that standpoint from the driving side of things and then the racecraft um because you're going so quick the cars are so much more affected by cars around them and so you've got to be able to learn how to predict what a car is doing in front of you no kind of how much of a different line that you can take before you get into the gray area. So there's a lot of, of intricacies that go into it. And you're right, you know, I think a lot of the European guys, myself included, adapted to the road and street courses pretty instantly, um, but the ovals took some time, but it's not impossible. You know, I had success at Indianapolis. Marcus obviously just, just won the, the Indy 500 a, a couple months ago. So it is very possible, but it's, uh, it, it is a whole different uh, learning experience. Yeah, it must be difficult when you are in that learning phase. You don't have the experience, but you say you did pretty well. You took to it like a duck to water. Your sixth 
ever IndyCar race was the Indy 500. You won that race. What did that do to change your life and your career? From a, from a life perspective, it didn't change really anything. You know, I'm still Alex. I'm still the person that I am. But from a career standpoint, you know, I, I came over to to uh, the States on a one-year deal. You know, I was in a car that had very little sponsorship. You know, they were able to make it work because they were, it was two teams merging. So they kind of had budget from, from two different areas. And so the fact that we were able to have that success and go win the Indy 500 um, solidified my relationship with Napa Auto Parts, um, who's still a, a primary kind of sponsor of my car to this day, with Honda and, and with Andretti Autosport. Um, and had that event not happened, I don't know that, you know, my career would have progressed the way that it has in, in the series, you know, certainly we had some other kind of bright spots of 2016, but nothing is as big as, as winning the Indy 500. So from a career standpoint, it, it gave me a new home. Um, it gave my career kind of a new breath of, of fresh air um, to a certain extent. And it, it made me a, a, a driver or a person that was kind of valuable to the series because as an Indy 500 winner, you know, you spend the entire um, following 11 months promoting the next year's event. So for me, it was, I was the, the kind of spokesperson for the 101st running of the Indy 500. And so with that, you get to be in a lot of opportunities. You get to have a lot of opportunities from a media standpoint, um, from a national advertising standpoint. And so it just makes you a, a kind of fixture of the series. So for sure, I don't know that I would be where I'm at now without, without that win. And what's the week like after the Indy 500? We spoke to Marcus Ericsson last time on the show, and he said, very much like Ryan Hunter Ray, it's the most invigorating week, but also the most tiring week of your life. Would you agree with that? If, for me, it was really hard because I'm, I'm an introverted person in, naturally. Um, so then being kind of thrust in the center of all of these different things that was relentless was hard for me, but I'll never forget my, the, the team PR rep at the time. Um, she just looked at me and she was like, you have to stop complaining. There are 32 other people that want to be in this position. And that, that does put it in perspective, but for sure in the moment, like it's a lot, man, you, I'll never forget, you know, you have the, you have the event on Sunday, you kind of finish with all of your, your stuff, your obligations you have to do by nine o'clock that night. You're up at six to do the, the photo shoot on the, on the art of bricks. And then you kind of get a little bit of rest on the Monday. You have the banquet and then you're immediately to New York and you're operating on like two or three hours of sleep for like a week, just pushing, you know, everything that had just happened, which is great. But then you have a race in Detroit, um, kind of bookending that. So it, it is hard, but every year that goes by that I have to watch someone else do that. Um, I'm pretty, pretty annoyed. You know, you, you get a taste of what it's like to be that guy and, and to have that success. And I think it's even more motivating than the people that haven't won it before because they don't quite know what they're missing out on. For me, you know, I know that every year that goes by is another opportunity that's potentially passed for, for being able to win it again. And it, it's a hard event. It's a bit like Le Mans in the sense that they say, you don't win Le Mans, Le Mans chooses you. And you've only got to look at Scott Dixon in terms of his challenges and and how close he's been i mean you're in that bracket when we go to indy every year now from 2016 onwards you've been one of the cars to beat everyone looks at what you're doing you're in that bracket you know what's rossi doing what's andretti doing and you've kept the fans on the edge of their seats throughout the years as well with some monster passes through turn one turn two that kind of stuff and it's it's just not quite worked out, but you know, you, you must feel incredibly confident. It, it's almost like a second home when you go back there. Oh, you're absolutely right, man. Like it's um, every, every year that I go there, the appreciation for the event builds um, my love and, and respect for that race and the speedway and the history of it grows as I learn more things. And I experience more things each year that we go back and um you know, I've been very fortunate to, to drive for, from kind of day one, drive for a team that, you know, has the Speedway figured out in a lot of respects. You know, there's some years that, 
you know, we have a little bit more of an edge on previous years for whatever reason. But ultimately, I know that every time I show up there, I'm going to have the equipment and the tools to, to go and, and fight for something. And, and that's really special as a racing driver to know that. And, you know, certainly um, you're right. I, I do think the place chooses its winner. You know, you look at 2016, I, I didn't have the fastest car. You know, we were a, a top 10 car. We were an okay car, but somehow through errors and problems, we won that race. And then I look at 2017, 2019, 2020, where I think I, I legitimately had the quickest car that month and, and to win the race. And for one reason or another, um, it didn't quite work out. So, you know, I... I hate what Scott's going through, even though he's a competitor of mine. Like I wouldn't wish what, what he had happened to him on, on my worst enemy, you know, to, to have the, the equipment and to dominate so much of that race and, and to have it go away for, for one tiny thing is, is heartbreaking as a fan and as a person that just loves Indy 500, that, that sucks to watch. Um, but I think he's also one of those people that he finds a lot of motivation through defeat and uh, it's just going to make him that much harder to beat next year. Yeah. So before we move on from the Indy 500, who put the uh, balls in Connor Daly's hot tub? Me, man. I spent, oh, like, I spent like $600 on little plastic, <laughs> little plastic balls to fill his hot tub. First of all, why are you bringing a hot tub to a racetrack? Like that's, that's issue number one. And then issue number two is the fact that he was naive enough to think that no one was going to do anything to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a wonderful storyline. There were some good pranks this year, mate. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, that yeah. always keeps us entertained. So moving on, looking at 2018, 2019, obviously vintage years for you, second or third in the championship, didn't quite get over the line. But uh, your brand in IndyCar was was booming then, an Indy 500 win, very much one of the drivers that everyone looks at in terms of a championship charge as well. And uh, years that you probably look back at with fond memories. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's always hard to, to put it in perspective, especially when you're still competing, because you look back on the near misses and you can easily pinpoint, you know, those two events that got away from us and it's you remember that more than you remember the the good moments and the, the win and the success so um my personality always looks back on those years as yeah they were good but it's a real shame that x y and z happened such as life you know such as the sport such as everything that we we choose to do each day you know there's always ifs ands or buts but um yes for sure those were uh phenomenal years in terms of as you said kind of developing my brand in the series and, and raising my my stock value if you will and um you know that it was it was close in a lot of respects um but ultimately you know we continued the relationship with andretti autosport um through that time period and we were able to kind of bring on a new partner and at the end of 2019 going into 2020 with auto nation which is you know one of the largest car dealerships in the world. Um, they just surpassed Penske, which is a little kind of uh, uh, internal competition that we all have with each other. Um, and yeah, so that kind of, again, introduced me to a, to a whole different world of people and, and build, build that relationship up. And, and here we are in 2022. Um, you know, 18 and 19 was good. 20 and 21 was, was terrible. So, you know, I guess it's balanced out in, in some weird way. <laughs> Yeah, but just talking about 20 and 21, you know, the, the introduction of the aero screen, I think, uh, affected the Andretti cars more than some of the other cars, maybe on the ovals, especially. And But you were back at it at the final third of 2020. And yeah. 2021 was a difficult year. Though. For sure. You know, I think it's, it's a weird one. So a lot of things happened in 2020, obviously. Um, and so... You know, our season was delayed. Um, we had the introduction of the aero screen, which is a, a, a big component, you know, A, a big component from a safety perspective, but B, just in, in size, right? You know, it's, it's large, it's heavy, you know, the weight is forward and up high. Um, so it certainly does have an impact on, on the car and, and the way that you have to set it up to, to get the maximum lap time out of it. And so I think if you look at 2020, you know, it was, it was a very reduced schedules in terms of we were trying to get in and out of events in like one or two days. So practice time was cut. Um, obviously testing was cut. Everything that we were doing was, was kind of trying to 
um, still get a season in, but to do it in the shortest amount of time possible to, to limit people's exposure and, and, and dealing with local health officials and, and all that stuff. So I think a lot of what happened in 2020 was kind of a knock on effect of, of that. And, and the 27 car, my car, our side in particular struggled to kind of adapt quick enough and other teams were able to, to kind of get the, the edge on us. And then you go to 2021, and I think there was so much, um, you know, desire and almost over over trying from everyone's standpoint to rectify what had happened in 2020 and get back to where we thought we should have been and where we should have been. And that's a slippery, dangerous slope to go down, especially in the sport, um, because it doesn't owe you anything. You know, just because you have two good years and then a bad year, it doesn't mean that, oh, the next year everything's going to be just fine if you just try hard, right? That's not, it's not the way it works. And I, I got caught up in that personally, and, and I learned a lot um, about myself and, and you know, just my, my mental state through that whole process. And it was, it, it was hard, you know, 2020, it, as you said, at the end of it was pretty good. You know, we were on the podium, I think, four, four times in a row. Um, and 2021, we only saw the podium once, I believe. Um, so we actually made things worse, despite the fact that I think the car was better. I think the team was operating in a better space. You know, everyone had kind of gone through COVID and, and mechanics and engineers were more secure with their futures. And, and there was just a better headspace within the entire organization. And despite all that, the results were worse. Um, which was obviously a tough pill to swallow. And it's hard, right? You know, we, we used to talk about it uh, back in the day, that the psychology of things, and when you're in it, you can't, it comes, it's fast and furious. There's no time to control all the lead. And, you know, Will Powers talked about it this year. So Scott Dixon in terms of, you know, he's talked about his struggles at the beginning of this year with his qualifying and, and various other things and, and just overcomplicating things and you know it makes perfect sense when you explain it now but when you're in the moment it's hard to turn turn that around you're right 100 percent. um and the other thing that kind of compounded all of that was you know there was teams and drivers that were coming in that were just the the level was raised you know in 2018 and 2019 if you had a bad day, you were fifth, sixth, right? You, it was, it was myself, Joseph, Will, Simon, um, Hunter Ray, right? Colton. See, so you had, you had five or six guys that, that were always kind of competing for it and, and up there. You fast forward to 2020 and 2021 and the introduction of, you know, Marcus finding a lot of pace, Pato Award, Alex Pelo, um, Felix, you know, obviously, you, you, you're still your Josephs, your Scotts, your Wills, your Simons. It just your bad days instead of being fifth or sixth were twelve, right? And so the the margins you had for everything to be right just got smaller. And so to kind of reinvent your team and yourself, you know, through a trying time, you know, outside of the race car and inside the race car. It was it was the wrong time to do it ultimately because you were punished for every little miss um, that you had whether that was in a race or in qualifying or whatever. Yeah, and what camp would you say you're in? Because I don't think you're in. You're not a, a youngster and you're not a veteran yet. So you're kind of like in that halfway hat. Fortunately, yes. Like thank God I'm not considered like one of the guys that you know. It's a ticking clock. You know, I just turned thirty. Well, not just I turned thirty at the end of last year. Um, obviously I've been doing it now for six years. So, you know, I do have a lot of experience from that standpoint of just, you know, it's getting close to hundred races, right? I had a hundred races in Long Beach or something like that. Um, but in theory, I would like to believe that I still have another decade plus, um, you know, to, to offer, you know, what I can do to the sport and, and to the series and, and to whatever teams I'm driving for. Cool. So looking at 2022, where do you see the circuits where that you can really capitalize? I know that you're going to say that you, you are gunning for the championship, but where the big points going to come from, do you think? I mean, you go well at Mid-Ohio, uh, Toronto, you go well at as well. It's good to see Toronto back on the calendar, but, but what are you targeting? Yeah, I mean, we need to maximize, you know, Toronto's our last three-course race, 
Andretti, I think, is, is the team to beat on street courses. We haven't maximized it yet. Um, obviously, Colton won in Long Beach. We were close in Detroit. We, we should be winning. Honestly, we should be winning all the street course races. Um, so we, we really need to do a good job in Toronto. I think Portland and Laguna are good for us. Um, I think Mid-Ohio, we have history there. We haven't been mega. We've been okay. You know, I, so I think that hopefully the step that we found that kind of re returned us to form in Road America, you know, I think will all apply in Mid-Ohio um, here in a week and a half. Honestly, the, what I'm focused on is trying to just stop the bleeding a little bit in our Iowa's and Gateway. You know, those are the two places that we need to go into those weekends. And if we can come away with a fifth and a sixth or a third and an eighth or something like that, we'll, we'll be okay. You know, because I know that Joseph's probably going to win both Iowa races or at least be on the podium for both of it's them. A, it's a big points hole for him. I it's mean, it's huge, man. It's, it's two races. And I think we are one of the weakest teams there, you know, so we're testing there in, in two weeks. Um, but I think there's three or four teams that are better than us at Iowa. So we really have to, you know, come away not losing too much ground. And then I think really everywhere else um, is a pretty, it suits us pretty well. And then just looking at the future, obviously you've signed the new deal for 2023. You'll look back at uh, your years with Andretti with, with a huge amount of fondness, but you must be excited to see what the, the future holds. I mean, Arrow McLaren, a, a really exciting prospect. And Zach, how well do you know Zach? We interviewed him before the Indy 500. He's a really good guy. And he's, he's a yeah. fan underneath all of that commercial experience and professionalism. But how well do you know him? So I've gotten to know him much better um, in the past couple of months than, than I obviously previously had. And, and you're right, you know, the fact that he still races his, his vintage cars um, as an F1 team principal is, is pretty awesome. You know, he just, he just loves everything about racing. He's either an F1 race, a IMSA race, a WEC race, an IndyCar race. They're now doing Formula E next year. Um, he's everywhere. He's, he's on the road. He just, he loves, he loves competing and he loves the sport. So that's obviously amazing. Um, and you're right. You know, I am excited. Obviously, you know, Michael and the entire Andretti Autosport organization gave me a huge opportunity. And it's, it's no secret that I don't think any of us expected when we re-signed in 2019. You know, we didn't expect the, you know, the following two and a half years to go as they have. Um, and that's no one's fault per se, you know, but for whatever reason, it, it wasn't coming together and it wasn't working out. And, you know, as, as we kind of touched on, turn 30, um, and, you know, the, the next kind of decision needs to be one that's, it's a very important one because I'm going to be in that kind of prime, if you will, of, of my career and, and need to be in a place where, you know, I feel I have the best opportunity to, to win races and compete for championships. And, you know, so in a lot of respects, um, you know, Aaron McLaren ticks all those boxes. Um, they are a team that seem to go from strength to strength every single year and, and, and have a lot of desire and, and passion and, and runway to kind of get there. So that's exciting. Um, but that being said, we still have four months left of, of this season. And, and my entire focus is on getting the best possible results for myself and, and the whole Andretti Sport organization. And believe it or not, somehow, you know, we're on the outside kind of fringe of, of having, having a shot at this thing. So if we can, if we can get a win going here, um, then we're, we're firmly in the fight and, and who knows what can happen. Yeah. It's a bit, Big momentum championship, isn't it? Looking at McLaren as well, Pato's a big sushi fan, so I know you're a, a big sushi fan, mate. And uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll bond over that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then, buddy. Well, listen, thanks so much for taking the time out to join us. I know you're it, it's not a break for you, but it is a break given how busy the schedule was month through may and june but uh yeah we wish you all the luck in iowa and for the fans you can catch up with all the action from mid ohio on the 3rd of july live on sky sports action sky sports f1 red button and sky sports f1 uh, from myself tom gamer and alexander rossi it's goodbye